All right. Jose Neves, CEO of Farfetch, thank you very much thank indeed. You there is so much to touch on with you and with your business and with the biography of you as an entrepreneur. But I want to start back in 2007 when you founded the business. And then you had to navigate through the financial crisis. You have to navigate through the Eurozone crisis. And then potentially, possibly, arguably, this unique moment that we're facing right now. Inflation, geopolitical risks, cost of living crisis. Talk to us about, as you look back, the meshing between technology and retail, and particularly the luxury space, and how that's evolved over that time, how you've managed to navigate all of those different challenges by bringing those together. Um, look, I, it's a very passionate uh, topic for me because I, I started as a coder, actually, as a computer programmer. And I'm, I'm from the north of Portugal. There's lots of fashion companies there, factories, studios, more industrial uh, companies. Um, so that, that, those were my clients. I started developing software for the fashion industry when I was 19 with our uh, CTO. So we date back 30 years or something like that. Um, and then I came to London to be a shoe designer uh, when I was 22, so um, um, go figure. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and I fell in love with the, fas with the fashion industry. It's, it's, about, um, it's part of culture. It's about creativity, craftsmanship, um, and uh, quality. And it deals with emotions, deals with individuality, expression of one's individuality, so it's absolutely fascinating. And it always, for me, the most fascinating thing was how are these two worlds going to come together and how can technology foster this part of culture that is fashion and, and vice versa? And how can we bridge those two worlds? And that's, that's Firefetch, that's the, the core of, of the mission of Firefetch is to bridge these two worlds of the creators and the curators of fashion and lovers of fashion all around the world. And, and yes, we've been through a major uh, crisis since, I mean, we launched um, October 2008, and two weeks later, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and everyone thought the world was going to end. No one would buy anything. Um, and, um, and that was the, the year 2009. It was the only one of two years where the global luxury industry dipped. And the other one was 2020 with COVID. So for 25 years, this industry has been incredibly resilient, actually. Um, and obviously, we've seen the digitization of the industry take place. It was an industry that was always very resistant to technology, very fearful of technology, uh, because you know, in a way, it's, it's human versus machine. And we were watching the previous panel and very um, powerful conversation around that. Mm. Uh, but the machine can help the human, right? And that's, that's um, but that, that debate, that tension, you feel it in, in, the, in the fashion industry. And, um, and our journey has been really to try to bridge those two worlds. What, what are the next barriers, do you think, that will crumble in the, in the face of this tech evolution? We've seen, of course, the acceleration during the pandemic. Acceleration is a catalyst, that event. Uh, what are the next barriers that are going to fall as, as tech continues to evolve? I think there's so much to do. Uh, if you look at the penetration of, of online in the luxury industry, it's only 22%. Uh, Pre-COVID was 13%. So it's, it's, it actually doubled to 26% during COVID because the stores were closed. They normalized to 2022. But 80% of fashion, of high-end fashion, is still bought in physical stores. So for me, the, the ultimate frontier is how do you uh, dissolve the barriers between physical and digital? How do you make the physical star, um, uh, you know, how do you bring the, 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 the human interaction that is unique to a physical star and elevate it through technology? Because if you go to a star today, it, it's the same as experience as in the 90s. It's, you just have a contactless, maybe, payment, mm. but you still, it's, uh, you know, the salesperson still disappears to try to find your size and comes back, sorry, sir, don't have it, let me call another star, etc. So there's even basic things like that, you know, payments, um, you still queue up to make your payments, or maybe they bring, if it's a, a, a more elevated star, they will bring the machine to you, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it wasn't touched, it's one of those areas in our lives that wasn't touched by technology. Every, everything else, even Starbucks, you can order 
um, on, on an app, right, and just show up and pick it up. And, and luxury really hasn't uh, fully embraced this digitization, and for good reason, because it, could, it can sometimes kill the, the customer experience, and they don't want that. Uh, but how can we apply technology to elevate, elevate the, the, the human experience in Star? And that's what we've done with Browns here in London, uh, in Brook Street, uh, with a company we acquired uh, five years ago, very iconic 50-year-old retailer, and we invested in, in technology to make, to make it the shopping experience of the future, with Chanel um, in, in France, um, and, we're, and now with Richemont, the plan is to bring this, what we call luxury new retail, Vision. So for me, actually, it's quite simple. The next big frontier is how do we digitize not just you know, pockets of the industry, but how do we unify the entire experience, both online and offline, and bring that together. And that's, that's where the biggest opportunity is. With, without losing that kind of exclusive cachet that goes, goes with luxury. And, and what, would, what mm -hmm. role would AI play in that? I think it, it plays... Uh, a really important role, uh, but always in terms of assisting, assisting the human. It's actually one of the most complex problems uh, in AI is, um, is fashion, because it, it, it changes all the time. It's driven by creativity, which is something that machines don't deal very well with. Um, and, uh, and, and it deals with culture, cultural trends, with the zeitgeist. And um, just because everyone is using polka dots doesn't mean that you should continue producing and designing polka dots, probably the other way around, right? And, and it can change from one season to another or from one week to another. And this is extremely difficult for computers to, to predict. So it's, it's not, it's, it's really if you speak to the real experts, AI people that have focused on solving the fashion problem through AI, they'll tell you that this is really about assisting the human, but the role of curation and the role of creativity will be you know, human-led, I hope forever, but at least for many, many years to, to come for that. Now, how are you thinking? I should at this point, by the, by the way, say that please do send in your questions as well to Jose. They'll come up on the screen. We'll put them to Jose through, throughout this conversation. How are you thinking about, about the metaverse? And I don't want this to be a platform for, for Facebook bashing, but when I think of the metaverse, you do have to sleep. You know, you're drawn to that image of Zuckerberg's legless avatar. Uh, are, you, are you confident this is more than a... More than a pie-in-the-sky kind of aspiration, how important do you think the metaverse will be for that kind of goal of yours, which is the greater digitization, particularly that consumer and customer experience? I, I, I prefer to talk about Web3 as opposed to metaverse, mm -hmm. uh, because the metaverse for me is a sub-component, it's one of the ideas around this revolution that is Web3, right? And for me, the best definition is Web1 and um, as a computer programmer, I was web zero, like no web in the 90s, right? In the early 90s and 80s. So then I saw web one, and web one, you can think of it as read, as an internet where you can read stuff. And that's Yahoo as a portal, and where you would find the links or other places or, or Netscape, those are very early non-interactive, um, one direction portals. Um, so that was web one. And then web two was about user-generated content. And, and uh, companies like Farfetch, Airbnb, Uber, like um, two side marketplaces, um, and and obviously social media, etc. So that it's and you can you can um, uh, define it by read write. So you read and you write, and the system interacts, and out of that interaction, the, the experience becomes much richer, much more powerful. And Web three is about read write own. So it's when you're, you're actually owning the assets, um, your data, you can own your data, you can be rewarded financially for interacting with the systems um, and uh, in a decentralized way. And, it's, and that is very, very powerful. So I, I, I truly believe that Web3 lives up to its name and it will be the next step and stage um, and revolution. So on how, the how do you position for that? Are you investing in areas? Now, Are you doing R&D in this space? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think now the metaverse is one of the ideas. You, we, you, can, you can mention crypto, uh, DeFi, um, NFTs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then you have the metaverse, and metaverse is one of the ideas. And quite frankly, my personal opinion is um, 
I, I certainly don't think it's going to be owned by a corporation or a company. Um, and I, I certainly, I, I think that a totally virtual world and experience is ultimately inherently unsatisfactory. Because we're three dimensional beings, you know, like we were talking about the difference between being here and being on Zoom calls for a couple of years, right? It's very different. Even for the audience that is watching us, mm. the fact that we are in the same space grabs their attention much more than if we were both on Zoom, right? We were just talking about this. And because we're three-dimensional beings driven by, by feeling and, and emotion, uh, that translation in a virtual world is very poor indeed, and I think it will always be. Um, but it has its applications in gaming, for example. But, to my, to, to, but gaming is already huge, right? So, so I think actually you will see gaming, in my view, games becoming metaverses, as opposed to the other way around, because it's much easier. If you have a huge install base already, it's much easier to decentralize when there are economic forces at stake there. But in a way, it, will be, it has to be gamified. The idea that I just go because it's a more satisfactory experience than in the real world, I think is absurd. And therefore, I think it's going to take much, much longer than what some people are predicting. And definitely, being owned by a company is contradictory to the whole philosophy of Web3, which is decentralization. So it will, it will, if it happens, it will take time. I think it will get, be gamified, and it will be decentralized. It will be a protocol, ideally, okay. right? And that's, that's the way the metaverse is, is going, okay. I think. Uh, really, really interesting. I'm just going to loop back to the AI question, because we've had a question come in from the audience. How can you use AI to make the fashion industry more sustainable? That's an excellent um, question. Um, I think, uh, first of all, the fashion industry has huge sustainability issues. Um, it's, 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 it's very polluting. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of overproduction. I think actually overproduction is the lowest hanging fruit and the biggest impact that we can have. If we can just predict better what people are going to buy, produce less, ideally even produce on demand. Um, I'm an investor and, and, um, of, of a company and I'm on the board of a company called Platform E. Um, pardon the publicity, uh, that, that works on on-demand um, on demand luxury and, and working with companies like Hermes, companies like Dior, where the, the, the items are not actually produced until you buy them. So you have zero um, overproduction, and that's very powerful. The other thing is companies like Vestiaire Collective, Real Real, et cetera, that are in the circular economy, right? So if you can buy something that uh, was pre-owned, that certainly extends the life of the product. Um, in terms of AI in particular, predicting uh, the, the, the trends Can't hear myself. OK, there we go. Okay, it's working now. Um, so yeah. I think you know, that's, that's one concrete area. Uh, but there are many other uh, applications. I think you know, sustainability is a vast, vast um, you know, topic, and, and we're very active with, with clear sustainability goals at Farfetch for yep. 2030. One of them is to be more circular than linear, mm -hmm. and we've invested in pre-owned and, and in rip what, rip what about rip. creativity? Another question has come in on the question of creativity and AI, whether AI enables creativity within the luxury space or, in fact, degrades that, and there's a risk to creativity if you start to pull in AI? I, th I don't think, I think it enables creativity. And if a company wants to replace creativity by AI, they will fail very, very fast. AI is really not, certainly not in fashion. I don't know in other areas, but it's certainly decades away, 20, if you're op an optimist, if you're, if you're an AI maximalist that believes that computers will do everything better than humans, I fundamentally disagree with that, but what do I know? I'm not an AI expert. Uh, but even the experts that are AI maximalists, they'll tell you we're 20 years, 10, 20 years from, um, from removing the creative function and job uh, of, of humans in, in an industry like fashion. So it's always, so if a company attempts to do that, they will fail very fast. Uh, however, that, let's not dismiss it because I mean, the amount of stuff that gets produced, industrialized, and ends up in the landfill, just because people are not using data at all, and not using AI at all, 
to your point around sustainability, uh, it's a huge missed opportunity. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't dismiss AI. Let's use AI so that we pred can predict trend trends and have a more sustainable industry. Okay. I, I want to talk about deal making. We've got a chart I think we can throw up that shows how active you've been in terms of partnerships, deal making, investments, the likes of Alibaba, JD, Reebok, of course, and most recently, arguably your most significant, which is the 47.5% stake in YNAP, Uke's net aporte. Talk to us about the rationale behind that deal, where it positions you, how it positions the company, and whether you're going to be taking over all of those shares ultimately. So the rationale is really about our vision for the future of luxury. As, uh, we call it luxury new retail. For us, it's the convergence of physical and digital. Um, and that captured the, the, the attention of the luxury industry. A few years ago, we had a conference in 2016 where we laid out this, this vision. Um, uh, and, and we've developed technology um, that, that really brings those two worlds together. Um, Cartier, uh, one, maybe the, 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 the most important maison in the Richemont group, uh, really loved everything we were doing with other, um, uh, with other, in other, not in high luxury, but in fashion. Um, and we worked very closely with the Cartier management team to see how did, this could be applied to, to, to high luxury. And they came to the conclusion that to the next step in the digital um, strategy and, and, and advancement um, for Cartier, and then socializing it with the other maisons for the Richemont group, was the, the Farfetch vision and the Farfetch technology. So it, it actually came from the, tech, the technology side. Um, and, and at the point, we said, well, if we're going to do something really big and strategic with all the maisons, we should also re-platform YNAP. Uh, but of course, if we do that, then how do we align interests between the two companies? And that, that naturally evolved to the deal we have today. Do you take full control at some point? So right now, there's, there's regulatory approval to go through. Um, uh, we will, um, after a successful regulatory approval and completion of the deal, we will own 47.5%. So no one will have a controlling stake in that company, so it will be joint control. Uh, we're very excited uh, to work with, with Richemont Group uh, in the transformation of YNAB from a retailer, a luxury retailer, a very prestigious luxury retailer, but a retailer still, into um, a platform, a true platform, where brands can sell directly. And this is transformational for the industry because there are more than 1,500 brands and designers, some of them small emerging designers, that use those platforms and that sell um, on those platforms a very important part of their business, and we can enable them to go direct to consumers through those platforms. Okay, we're running very short of time, and in fact, we've run out. But one last question I have to ask you. The dollar at record highs, the euro at 20-year lows, the pound, of course, front pages, levels we haven't seen since the 1970s. Good or bad for a company like yours listed in New York dealing with European luxury? Um, from a, an accounting and reporting perspective, bad because we report in dollars, so even though we're growing in euros and in certain areas of the business growing very fast in euros, you then translate it to, to dollars and it's, um, it's much lower growth or even dips into negative growth. So we reported negative growth, small negative growth, but it was actually positive growth in constant currency. So the, the, but this, that's just the, the translation, it, it just it doesn't... Um, and, and, it, and the sophisticated investor reads through that and understands that the underlying business is incredibly strong. Of course, we had the war in Ukraine, the COVID-19 situation in China, which have materially impacted our growth yeah. this year. Uh, but, but the rest of the world, the underlying business is, is extremely strong. Okay. Jose Neves, CEO of Farfetch, thank you very much indeed. That is the time.